target area for the strangest invasion of our time. An invasion by its own people, Germans fleeing oppression in the Soviet zone. Since 1945, the German Federal Republic has granted political asylum to more than nine million refugees, expellees, and displaced persons. But since the Soviets instigated the scorched earth policy, which slammed shut the borders between the East and the West, the only escape left is through Berlin itself. Weary, frightened, and always after dark, these hunted people are pouring into the city on an average of 20,000 a month. The desperately overburdened city finally broadcast an urgent appeal to the people in the Soviet zone with these words. Do not leave unless you are in direst need. The zone must not be deprived of honest, free-thinking Germans. We beg you, stay on the soil of your homeland. And still they come. A new nation is growing rapidly within Berlin, the nation of the homeless. Here, by law, all refugees register and ask to be granted sanctuary. Of the 2,000 refugee camps in the German Federal Republic, over 70 are in Berlin, and new ones are continually being added. These are the acceptance camps, where each refugee must live and wait until his case is reviewed, while his fate is being decided. This is the camp called Tempelhof, a bombed out factory, patched together to provide shelter such as it is during this period of waiting. The faces you see, the voices you hear, the interviews you will witness are the faces and voices and stories of these refugees themselves. Every day, familiar people, they are from every walk of life, people like you and me. The things that happened to them could happen to us, here but for the grace of God. Here a person loses his name and becomes a number. It is better to become nameless than risk the safety of someone who has been left behind. A blanket, a tin plate and a cup. These become a person's total earthly belongings. Because of the desperate lack of housing facilities, families have to be separated. Wait here, you have to sleep in the main ward. The men from the women. And this in a strange place so far from home is frightening and very lonely. Maria had a pretty little house in Saxony, a little house of her own. The men are able to carry their own beds to their sleeping quarters. It isn't difficult. A straw pallet to lay on the floor isn't very heavy. There is loneliness here too. A man who has been married for 40 years is awkward with a needle. He is writing a letter to his wife, denouncing her as a communist, telling her he hates her and not to think of him again. He hopes this will protect her when the police question her about his escape. And he hopes she will understand just how much he really loves her. They're homesick too, and dream of school and friends. But if they're allowed to stay in the West, they won't grow up to be beaten into a hopeless cripple as this man was. His crime? He was arrested as a saboteur because he had no coal to heat his restaurant for a Red Army party celebrating Lenin's birthday. There is one hot meal a day. Berlin feeds in this one camp more than 4,000 refugees in the two hours between six and eight each night. It's not much of a meal, but there will be no frightening knock on the door to disrupt their supper and perhaps their lives. Not me. And for this they give thanks. Um. 
values change in times of deep trouble. A simple thing like children unafraid to sing the hymns of their homeland becomes a big and wonderful thing. Now listen, all of you are from the Russian zone. You have lost everything, your home and your parents and your clothes. All your little friends, your beds and tables and your pictures. All the things you like and your toys, your books, your dolls and your trains. Huh? Maybe you had a little kitten and you miss all that, yes? But one thing you have not lost. You know what I mean, our good Lord. And you can never lose him if you really love him. He's always with you, even if you don't see him. He watches over you. And you need not worry. A man's mind emerges and thinks again when he's allowed to read an uncensored newspaper without fear of arrest. Their playground is a strip of rubble behind barbed wire. But the West Berlin policeman is a boy's friend and protector instead of a uniform threat to run and hide from. There's never a moment's privacy but a boy and his wife can comfort themselves with the shining dream that their baby will be born in a free land. A farmer's wife can speak out loud against oppression and godlessness. And in the bad moments of loneliness and despair, a woman can seek and receive comfort from a priest of her own faith. We got away alive, isn't it so? Imagine, at that time, more than a million people had been killed in 45 and 46. Yes, I know. And the Catholic Church lost more than one-third of our clergymen. And then, where did you go then? Saxony. We lived there for six years. In Saxony? And you liked it? Or... Well, we hadn't much of a choice. My husband at last got a job in a repair shop, and so did I. Later, we built a little house all by ourselves two rooms in a small kitchen. And then, only three weeks ago, one day destroyed all our plans and hopes for the future. We were invited to a birthday party, and there were some other people too. And they were very nice. But then the men started to talk politics. We could not believe it. When Erich came and warned us, they were going to arrest us and we should leave right away. A man who had that day been invited to the birthday party too had denounced us. We could not take anything. Not even a bag. He said we wouldn't have time to pack. We left within five minutes. And our daughter, we had sent her away on vacation. We couldn't take her with us. We couldn't wait for her. Is she still there? In the Russian zone? Or is she... Yes, she's still there. Mm, I see. You must not worry about her. She will be with you again. Remember how many terrible things have happened. Not only there, everywhere. I left in the middle of the night, was on the road for weeks. And 700 of my parishioners too, you know. We couldn't buy any food. We had to look for it in the houses, which were abandoned. But we made it after all, and you made it too, didn't you? There's always a way out, even if we don't see it. In the same kitchen where food is dispensed for the stomach, food is dispensed for the soul. Not much of a church, perhaps, but God is there. And a man is free to worship as he pleases. The man is free to preach what is in his heart. There are no toys to play with, but small hands are taught how to build something out of nothing. And the child who learns how to build a plaything learns how to build a life. This little rabbit is the innocent reason an entire family had to flee. Her kindergarten teacher in the Soviet zone offered a prize to the child who told the best story about the things her parents talked about at home. The 
little rabbit won the prize. Jump, little rabbit. Jump, jump, jump. Poet, scholar, young priest. No, just a boy who didn't believe, among other things, that babies should be trapped into betraying their parents. Why did you leave the Russian zone? I am against terror and oppression. My stepfather is a member of the Communist Party. His ideas, which I could not share, only confirmed my conviction that communism is something we must fight. All refugees must undergo many different screening processes during the waiting period. My father is in France and my mother worked in the Russian zone. But she did not earn enough, so she put in an application for relief. Well, and some days later she answered her, if she wanted a relief, she has to divorce my father. That was her condition. But my mother did not want a divorce, and so we left the Russian zone. Before each interview, hours of standing, waiting their turn to explain again and again why they came. You were in a school for forestry. Why didn't you finish it? I was one of the best students, but I refused to join the youth organization. They considered me politically unreliable, and they wouldn't let me go in for the exam. And what then? They were very nice about it. They only wanted me to become a member of the People's Police, and then I would pass all exams. I knew what that meant. The People's Police is a strictly military organization. Why did this young couple ask sanctuary in a free world? I and my wife are employed in a factory. I worked as a technical designer and she worked as a typist. We got a commission for eight Russian ships. The parts were sent to Russia to be assembled. I was supposed to go to Russia with five of our engineers to supervise the assembly. They wanted to make us sign a contract for an indefinite time. I told them I wouldn't sign. Upon my refusal, both of us were fired the following morning when we came to the office. They said I was to work in the uranium mines, in our, and I know that's Soviet forced labor. They gave me three days, and when we got home, we decided to leave that night. As we could not accept their proposal, the most important thing was to get out of the Russian zone. Are these people politicians or persons who played with politics? Because I didn't belong to the party, and because I helped a friend escape, I was suddenly drafted to work in a big mining company. Since I had been in the army, they wanted me for a special job. They gave me orders to teach the workers how to shoot. I refused because uh, a friend warned me and he said the Russian would put me under pressure and they would force me to do it. Are they plain ordinary people like you and me? Our factory produced, among many other things, a special wire goes which was used for dressing uranium ore. The Bolsheviks were determined to find a reason for confiscating the firm, the usual routine. And because they couldn't find a reason, they opened a mock trial. And this trial was based on the phony charge that the bookkeeping of the last five years was absolutely incorrect. It was perfectly ridiculous. My bookkeeping is correct. They wanted the factory, and in order to get it uh, legally, I mean, one of the key employees, or the owner, had to be sentenced to at least 15 years in prison or hard labor. Obviously, I would have been the victim. They had decided my books to be incorrect, so they were incorrect. Since I know their methods, I prefer not to take any chances. The next morning, I left and arrived in Berlin within four days. Could the things that happened to them happen to us? They force every farmer to deliver a certain amount of grain. I fled because I could not deliver enough and the supervisor came and, uh, and asked me why I was not in the barn threshing. That was when I came back from mowing on Monday. I said, no, I said. I cannot do any threshing. The electricity is cut off. And besides, I have to rig up hay because the winter is coming up and I have no fodder. And then I said to the supervisor, isn't it much simpler if you bring a rope along and hang me at all of us or send us to Siberia? After that, I grabbed his arm and I said, you better watch out, maybe you will hang someday too. He went away and two hours later, he comes back and gives me a letter from the police and also a summons from the district council.
It said that I had to report to the commissar at half past 12 on Friday night in Schwerin. When I arrived there, the commissar wanted a letter, and I uh, gave it to him, and he put it on his desk. The commissar asked me then if I had sent it to the supervisor. Yes, I say, I have sent it. Well, he says, then you are one of those who still hope that the Americans come. Get that idea out of your head, he says. You are going to deliver one and a half ton next Wednesday. And you better not keep me waiting. That is what he said. And when I got home, it was six o'clock. And I said to my wife, what are we going to do now? We have been married for 50 years. For 200 years, the land belonged to my family. I was born here, and I will kill myself before I give up. No, said my wife. No, we will not do that. We will pack our clothes and then leave for West Berlin. And that is what we have done. Lights out. The moment of darkness dreaded by everyone. The nights are the worst always. It's at night when a woman prays, and a man lies wakeful and thinks. It's at night when a person wonders desperately, did I say it right? Will they believe me? Will they let me stay? Will they give me a chance to work and be free? Will I be united with my husband? And our daughter, we couldn't take her with us. We couldn't wait for her. We have been married for 50 years. For 200 years, the land belonged to my family. I was born here. Here in a drama-packed little room, the evidence is weighed, the judgment is pronounced. Here, a three-man commission, men elected by the people, has the terrible responsibility of deciding thousands of human destinies. No one is sent back. Those who can prove they fled because of personal danger or other pressing reasons are granted the right to work and the right to live as individual free people. For the rejected ones, a bare existence in overcrowded permanent camps, objects of a necessarily meager charity. But knowing this, still they come. Out of the darkness, up into the light. Plain people and honest, who tried patiently to live under a system that in the end did not allow them to live. People whose only crime was an unshakable belief in the dignity of man. People who held to be true the simple but mighty words of Berlin's freedom bell. I believe in the sacredness and dignity of an individual. I believe that all men derive the right to freedom equally from God. I pledge to resist aggression and tyranny wherever they appear on earth. That this world under God shall have a new birth of freedom.